one that I'm not going to monetize. So the restrictions, as far as I understand things on YouTube, are far less as far as content goes. And so we're just not going to go down that route of monetization. So this is the first time I think I've ever gonna, I'm ever going to ask that the audience, uh, you know, do the whole like, subscribe, comment, that whole thing. But the most important part of that is to share. If you find what I have to say as being truthful and something that is convicting, then please share it. I really don't care if you like it, uh, like the video that is, um, or if, you know if it uh, emotionally makes you angry or sad. Like I'm not really interested in your emotions. What I'm interested in is sharing the truth. And if the truth is something that convicts you in a way that is motivating or is in a way that, that's uh, changing things, please share the video. That's all I ask for. Um, the story that I'm going to share with you really is about me and uh, where I'm coming from as a father. I have, I'm a father of four boys from my first marriage, two stepsons in my second marriage. And as you can tell, um, in between there, there was a divorce and a massive change in my life from a guy who was very self-centered, um, who was an atheist, and struggled with a lot of, I don't know, just uh, things about God that I didn't like. And I was, I was kind of ticked off. I wanted it my way. And one of the, my favorite phrases to kind of highlight my rebellious 40 years of life was, I want what I want. And it was something that really caught up to me in a way that was destructive. But at the same time, it was the thing that got me on my knees and uh, changed my life forever. So this is going to be a one take video. I'm not going to edit this video. Um, I may pause it, but I'm not going to edit it. So it's a long video. It's going to be a long version. I may or may not get this up in time. I usually try to get these things, this video up and posted by Friday, 9 a.m. That may or may not happen. It may be downloading while I go off to work. Who knows? I'm not even sure how long this video is going to be. Frankly, I don't care. Um, yeah, I'm going to say what I need to say. It's my channel. <laughs> and in this case, I want what I want. And I'm going to do this. But I'm going to do this in a way that, that respects the truth and respects the convictions that I have um, been exposed to uh, since my conversion in 2011. So we're going to get to that point because I think it's kind of an interesting walk of a guy who grew up in a Christian home with Christian parents, uh, read the Bible regularly, um, prayed, and I mean, I went to church three days, three times a week, twice on Sunday, once on Wednesday. Um, and I don't know if anybody else out there has that experience of just being forced as a kid to go to church and yeah, okay, so the pastor's talking about this, and the Bible says this, and I was like, yeah, okay, fine. And I even prayed the prayer. It's like, uh, yeah, I want to go to heaven. I don't want to go to hell. I want in, because I want what I want. And uh, that's what I want. And uh, I lived that way for quite a while. Meanwhile, in the background, I was coveting some things in my life that were absolutely destructive. And you cannot get away from that kind of stuff. And th the reality was this, I was an atheist. As much as I was doing all these things, I was doing them, I didn't believe them. And I didn't believe them with the conviction that needed to really demonstrate uh, faith in those things that I was doing. So I had zero faith in that. And so I was, I was philosophically an atheist. Uh, on the outward side, I was like this picture-perfect Christian guy who got married, had four boys, and, and all that. And meanwhile, I was being eaten alive on the inside out with uh, just my unbelief, with my bad habits, bad thoughts, um, the private sin in my life that was absolutely horrible. And to the point where I left my family, moved to Montana, um, took a job as an administrator as my way of like, I'm going to go do this, straighten everything out. And once I straighten everything out, I'm going to come back and I'm going to restart my life again. So I moved to Montana, um, and this was in 2010, and uh, I was completely alone. Matter of fact, the place that I had arranged to live, I had rented, started renting, uh, was rented out from underneath me. So I was in a hotel for three days um, trying to figure out where I was going to live. And I had a job, but I didn't have a place to live. And that was the beginning of a whole bunch of things. There was a death in the family. Um, I was moving, going through the divorce all kinds of different things. And I ended up having to go to see a doctor because my blood pressure was out of line and I, I knew it, I was stressed out. And he says, yeah, you're, you're pre um, high blood pressure. So he gave me some medication for that. 
And he was also an ex ex army doctor, and he said there's another way to do this, but uh, the only the only other way to do this is through intense exercise. And uh, he says intense means like you are huffing and puffing for a long time. So if that's your if that's your willingness to to do something like that, you can you can maybe not have to take these statin drugs. So I put that uh, bottle of prescription pills on my window uh, sill in the kitchen. And I worked my butt off and managed to get past that uh, high blood pressure thing. Um, at the same time, you know, I went to, to see a therapist because of all the things that were going on in my life. And the guy says, man, you've, you've kind of checked off every box. You have death in the family, you're going through a divorce, you're moving, you change jobs. Um, and you don't have a lot of friends where you're at because you moved to a place where you're totally unknown. So I had that going for me. Um, I was doing some some things that were not at all acceptable. Um, one of them was I would hike at sunset in areas known to have predators. <laughs> I didn't care. It's like if I'm going to go out, I'm going to go out in a, with a bang, you know, uh, maybe literally, but it's going to be something between me and a bear or me and a mountain lion or whatever the case might be. And it was this total ego trip, which really was meaningless. Um, it was just me just saying, "I want what I want. I, I want to do it this way." In the meantime, um, I'd signed up to climb a mountain, <laughs> another one of my reckless uh, encounters, and uh, I was going to climb Mount Rainier. And long story short, we're on the uh, face of the mountain, sheer ice, blizzard. I mean, this is like a Hollywood movie. Blizzard comes in, and I find myself um, putting my, my ice tool down, and I'm on my hands and knees, and it was the first time I was like, I don't want to die. <laughs> and I'm on this icy slope where you don't ever do that. You don't put your your hands and knees down, lift your, your feet basically with your crampons, which are the spikes that go on the bottom of your boots. I was completely exposed to sliding off the mountain. Completely. And it was sheer ice. It was like it was like a shiny, glossy ice because of the the amount of wind at this elevation. So and we were near the top. And that was the first moment where it was like, what I'm doing is reckless. And I'm on the fit side of a mountain up within moments of sliding off this mountain, you know, thousands of feet before I, before I stop. <laughs> My friend of mine used to tell me, he says, it's not the fall that kills you, it's the sudden stop. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Great, great advice. In that moment, I wasn't thinking about that, but afterwards I can definitely say that, yeah, it's, it's the sudden stop that gets you. So that was the summer of 2011, and uh, August 2011, I dropped my boys off at my ex-wife's house, and I'm in my parents' driveway, getting ready to come back to Montana. They lived in Minnesota, my boys did. And I, for whatever reason, I, it was like, I'm done. I'm done with this. And it wasn't something that I decided, it was something that just happened. I can't explain it other than I understand what it is now, and that is that when, when God calls whom He calls, you, when He calls you, He calls you. <laughs> like it's it's not a it's not a decision that I made. It was a response that I made, and that was what I had was this response of just unbelievable surrender, um, humility, and this was the the prayer that I said for the first time. I actually prayed honestly, and I said. To the God who I went to church three days a week as a kid, you know, read the Bible, you know, I thought I was a Christian and I just did not, did not live the life. And I told him, I said, I don't trust you. The creator of the universe and me, the created says to God, I don't trust you. I've never trusted you. These are like verbatim. This is what I said. The, the opening line of that prayer. I don't trust you. I've never trusted you with my relationships. And I said, I can't do this. So that was the end of me, as far as I knew it. And it was a life-changing moment. But it was the act of humility. It was that, that metaphorical, I'm on my knees, like, this isn't working. And I think when it comes to Father's Day, it's more than a, a watch. It's more than giving them a flashlight. It's fathers willing to get on a knee, humbly, in front of their family and saying, this is who I submit to. This is what I'm going to do today. (sighs) 
All right. Momentary pause. So that was that was my personal story when it came to the change that I went through. So August 2011, that was the moment um, that I responded to a call from God that was unbelievable, irresistible. Um, it changed my life. And the interesting thing was it... It changed my life from the inside out. I still had habits for years after that that I needed to address. Um, a lot of times people, Christians, are claimed to be hypocrites. And I don't know a Christian that's not a hypocrite. Um, and yet those that are not Christians somehow claim that because of that hypocrisy, Christianity is not a, a viable, viable faith. And I just think, so what hypocrisy are we willing to accept? Because everybody's a hypocrite. You know, so I just, I find that to be kind of a cowardly escape from the obvious truth um, when it comes down to it. Because as a former atheist who thought he had everything figured out, um, I obviously didn't believe in the correct God. I believed in me. And uh, that's total atheism. It's humanism. Whatever you want to call it, it's not belief in the, in the true God. And anything short of that is atheism. And that's, what I, that's where I was at. So um, that's what changed my life. But the, the important thing here, the message going to getting to Father's Day was at the time, and I still am, but at that time, being a father to four and being divorced and living in another state, the real challenges started to, to pop up. Like, how do you do this father thing uh, long distance? And number rule number one is you got to show up. So any of the dads that are out there watching this, you got to show up. You got to show up with some humility. You got to show up with some conviction. You got to show up with kindness and gentleness, and you got to show up with the idea that you're you're a father no matter what. And uh, so that was rule I, rule number one to me. And in, in any any kind of job or relationship or anything is step number one. You have to show up. You got to be there, whether or not you're there prepared or whatever. You just got to be present. And once you're present, the next step is to participate. And once you participate, then you have to increase the quality of participation. You have to be thoughtful. You have to be, you know, understanding. You have to be a person of conviction, all those kinds of things. But you got to show up and you have to participate. And showing up is part of participation. So that's what I, that's what I focused in on. And, and when it came down to just understanding the influence that I had as a dad, even though I was living outside of the realm of where my kids were living, um, I was learning that I still had this realm of influence in their life. And you got to take advantage of those things. And I, and I did the best that I could. Um, so without getting too much further down that path, because this is a huge topic and I don't want to spend, you know, hours talking about this, but I do want to talk about the role of men in family. And I want to read this to you. Um, I will try to have the link here for you, but I think it's really important to read this because whether or not you believe in God, I don't care. Matter of fact, it's that kind of ignorance is something that you foist upon yourself. It's not actually true. Um, and I know that because I lived that for 40 years. And I lived it in a way that I tried to pacify it. Um, but there are people who are just blatantly like, I don't believe in God whatsoever. Okay, fine, whatever. Um, it doesn't make it true. It just means that you're, you're hiding the fact of the truth. So... I want to read some statistics here, and these are statistics that I think are really telling as far as the influence that fathers have on a family. This does not demean the role of mothers at all. Matter of fact, there's a complementary nature between mothers and fathers in a family. That's why families with both the mother and, mother and father present um, are hugely, hugely effective at raising their kids in all kinds of different ways. No matter what secular, non-secular view you have of families, um, the, the presence of the mother and the father married um, in a healthy relationship, especially, uh, the impact on kids is tremendous. The impact on the family is tremendous. The impact on the spouse is tremendous. The impact on the community is tremendous. We're talking about positive. So here's the, uh, here's the thing I want to read to you. It's a few paragraphs, but it's not, it's not too long. According to data collected by Promise Keepers and Baptist Press, Baptist Press, if a father does not go to church, even if his wife does, only one child in 50 will become a regular worshiper. 
if a father does go regularly, regardless of what the mother does, between two-thirds and three-fourths of their children will attend church as adults. If a father attends church irregularly, between half and two-thirds of their kids will attend church with some regularity as adults. If a mother does not go to church, but a father does, a minimum of two-thirds of their children will end up attending church. In contrast, if a father does not go to church, but the mother does, on average, two-thirds of their children will not attend church. Another study focused on Sunday school found similar results on the impact of fathers. When both parents attend Bible study, in addition to Sunday service, 72% of their children attend Sunday school when grown. When only the father attends Sunday school, 55% of the children attend when grown. When only the mother attends Sunday school, 15% of the children attend when grown. When neither parent attends Sunday school, only 6% of the children attend when grown. Another survey found that if a child is the first person in the household to become a Christian, there is a 3.5% probability everyone else in the household will follow. If the mother is the first to become a Christian, there is a 17% probability everyone else in the household will follow. However, when the father is first to become a Christian, there is a 93% probability everyone else in the household will follow. So, and again, not to diminish the role of mothers, this is to accentuate the impact of fathers. So men, whether you're married, have kids, whatever, you cannot avoid the truth that we have and make a positive impact on families, on communities. And we're talking about a healthy, loving, caring, gentleness, the whole fruits of the spirit type thing. We make a positive impact when we show up, when we participate. And you gotta show up and you gotta participate. So, Father's Day, yeah, I'm gonna do a video, it's coming, it'll all have some gift ideas for fathers, but this is far more important. This is life-changing stuff. This is family-changing stuff. This is community-changing stuff. you got to show up. you got to participate. Because when you do, the situations around us change dramatically. Now, is that a lot of pressure? Yeah. But that's what we're designed for. That's what we're made for. We are made for that kind of challenge. All right? And, and mothers out there, please recognize the importance of fathers. You know, girlfriends, wives... Mothers, sisters, recognize the role of men in relationships as being very important, very crucial, especially when it comes down to Christianity, when it comes down to spiritual things. Massively important, massively important. And there's a whole research thing on fathers and daughters, fathers and sons. There's, there's plenty of research that's out there that shows the, the impact that fathers have. So take it seriously. Um, take this video to heart if this is something that... Uh, has any amount of truth uh, that you, you recognize or feel convicted over, please share it. I'm not asking if you like this video or not. I'm asking whether or not you feel like this. I'm asking whether or not you're convinced that this video has truth in it. And if it does, share it. That's it. And I don't care if it's me that gets the... It's not really me that wants the attention. It's just... I'm just saying this. Um, but I am looking for the message to get out. And if that's the way that this works, then that's what I'm asking. So... I think this is the only time I've ever asked that. I don't think any of the other videos I've ever asked for any kind of like, subscribe, that kind of, that kind of stuff. As I figured, like, oh, if you want it, you like it, you like it. But to me, this is important. It changed my life, and uh, I think it changes not only the lives of, of individual men, but I think it changes families, and I think it changes communities. It can change countries. Um, it's important. So there you go. My name is Tim. This has been another Real Ideal Gear conversation. We'll catch you guys next time.